I'm really honored to be talking to you today and to be recognized among all these talented scientists. And I want to tell you a little bit about our chemistry, but before that, I would like to tell you a little bit about my journey and how I ended up where I am today. Um, I was born in Mexico City. Uh, my parents had a farm and raised chicken among other animals. Um, so I grew up in the rural part of Mexico City and I was a lot in touch with nature and animals. Um, however, that was not the reason why I decided to go into science or chemistry. Um, I didn't have also any relatives that were scientists, as far as I know. So the reason why I became a scientist is a bit different. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a language issue. I was heavily dyslexic, so I couldn't speak well, and I, could, I couldn't really write or read until I was nine or 10 years old. On top of that, I was hyperactive, so it was really hard to focus. Um, so it's not really hard, hard to see why my parents were suggested that I should maybe go back a grade, uh, move to another school, or, or even take meds. Um, luckily, my, my parents persisted, helped me a lot. And just because of that, and because of the fact that I was excelling at science and math, I was allowed to stay with my classmates. Um, eventually, I was diagnosed, and I was treated and I slowly started to catch up with my classmates. And from then on, from then on I decided I, should, I, I wanted to be a, a scientist. Um, I was tempted by all different kinds of science, biology, math, physics, but I ended up deciding to go into chemistry because I realized the creating potential that chemistry has and the ability to create new things and, and, and hopefully things that would, could change the world. So I, I went into UNAM the School of Chemistry. For those of, who, of you who don't know, UNAM is a public university. It's completely free and it hosted, hosts over 360,000 students at a time. Um, UNAM was one of the best things that happened to me. First, because it allowed me to get an education that I might not have been able to get otherwise. Second, because it allowed me to get in touch with people from all different backgrounds and places of the world. And last, because it allowed me to explore my chemical curiosity by going into different labs. I went to, into an organic chemistry lab, then into a computational lab, an inorganic lab, and even a biochemical lab. Um, so it also allowed me to, to meet great personality of, of personalities of the, of, the chemi, of the chemistry medium. Here are a couple of pictures. And it even allowed me to go abroad to UCSB to study for a semester. So from then, after my bachelor's, I decided to do my PhD at Instituto de Química at UNAM as well, where I work in the group of Professor Wojtek Janczyk, doing inorganic chemistry, mostly synthesis and crystallography. And that would serve me very well later on, as you'll see. Also during, during my PhD, I was an exchange student at MIT on the, on the group of Christopher Cummins, where I had my first contact with, with materials chemistry. That was a really exciting time of, of my life. And it also made me realize I had a few things. First, that despite the language barriers, I was able to, I, I belonged there along, alongside so many other great scientists. And secondly, it made me realize um, that most people don't realize what chemistry looks in other parts of the world. I would often get, get questions or comments about the science in Mexico, like, so can you do a PhD in Mexico or can you do science in Mexico? And things of that sort that really stuck with me for, for a long time. After completing my, my PhD, I moved to Stanford University, where I work in the group of Gemma Caronadasa. I'm really thankful to Gemma because she gave me an opportunity despite uh, the fact that I wasn't able to secure funding for my own. So this was an opportunity that is rarely offered to someone that is coming from Mexico in a major university. So I'm really thankful to her and also because all, all the knowledge that, that she gave to me. Um, at Stanford, I developed, uh, or I, I got in contact with more material chemistry where I developed some gas capture materials and I also get in touch with some photovoltaics. After that, I was lucky enough to get offered a position back at UNAM. I decided to go back to UNAM for several reasons, but one of them is because I wanted to show the world that it's possible to do great science
from Mexico. So in 2015, I started my new group. It came with a lot of challenges. When I, when I got here, uh, I, was, uh, I was given a thousand bucks of startup funding and an empty lab. So, so I had to start from the very beginning. I was lucky enough to, to recruit some great students that I'm showing here. And slowly but surely, we started to get more people and more equipment and secure some funding. And I'm happy to report now that we are well over 10 people. Uh, we have a fully functioning group. And a testament to that is the fact that we have not one, but two social media accounts these days. Um, but what do we do? What do we do in our group? Um, I think our mission is to develop novel materials to help tackle important, practical, and fundamental issues to our planet and our society. And I would like to, to give an example in global warming and solar cells. As many of you may know, solar cells are one of the most promising technologies for, to reduce carbon emissions. Um, the leading technology is crystalline silicon and has been for, a, for quite a few decades. However, silicon has some issues or drawbacks. For example, it's relatively expensive. It requires a lot of energy to produce silicon solar cells. And thus, um, we're not deploying solar cells as fast as we sh probably should. So, so there came the idea that we should probably be developing materials that allow us to do solar cells that are way cheaper than silicon. Uh, around the time that I was starting my group, um, there was this boom in perovskite solar cells. Um, perovskite solar cells are a new technology that were just first reported in 2009. And at that time, their efficiency were about 4%. And in the span of over a decade, or just over a decade, the efficiency is now over 25%. To put this in context, uh, silicon has a, a similar efficiency, but, but silicon solar cells have been in the market or in, in development for over 50 years, while perovskites have reached almost the same efficiency in only 10 years or so. And the reason why perovskites are so, so fascinating and so exciting to the community is because they have a lot of really promising characteristics or properties to them. For example, they're made of cheap precursors. So that means that we potentially could do very cheap solar cells. They have high conversion efficiencies, as I just talked about. Uh, they also have high absorption coefficients, which means that we could do very thin and very light solar cells. And they have several other attractive properties. But as any other new technology, they also have some cons. Most notably, they put most of the state of their materials contain lead, which we know is toxic. They're unstable to moisture and light. And the, scal the scalability of these solar cells is still an issue, meaning that we can do very good small solar cells, but make the making them bigger can be really challenging. So we look at these two columns in, in my group and, and we try to, for one, try to tackle the cons by chemical synthesis. And in the other, just look at these pros and try to see if we can use these amazing properties into other applications or problems. So here are some examples of some projects that we develop in our group under, under that mission and looking at, at those possibilities. And today I wanna, I wanna tell you a little bit about lead-free perovskites. So we, we're trying here to tackle the problem of toxicity and stability. And for that, um, we started looking at copper antimony because both are relatively cheap, relatively non-toxic, and they're quite abundant. So we wanted to see if we could make uh, perovskite-like materials with, this, with these elements. So my student Brenda mixed copper and antimony with cesium in the presence of chloride, and what she found was this beautiful black polycrystalline powder that she was eventually able to crystallize. For solar cells, black is a really attractive color because it, it means that it's absorbing a lot of light. And if you want to do a good solar cell, you want to absorb a lot of light. So we wanted to investigate this material. Through single crystal X-ray crystallography, we were, we were able to characterize this and figure out that this, this was the first member of what we now call a later double perovskite, which is com composed of, of perovskite-like -like slabs made of antimony and copper. 
And beside the structure, we also find out that these materials were extremely stable towards light, towards humidity, and they also had um, electronic properties that suggested that they could make good solar cells. Apart from that, we, we were really excited because we, were, we had discovered a new family of materials that nobody had seen before that had a tremendous potential or so we thought. And to give you a glimpse, here is a, what we call the chemical diversity map of, of LDPs or layer double perovskites in which you can see that there are several different elements that you could potentially put in there. And if you consider all the possible permutation just along these elements, not to mention other ones that are not highlighted here, uh, you, could, you could see how many new materials you could potentially do. So we have focused on that and we have developed a, new, a whole new family of materials to show that there's, there's quite a few members of this family. Here I'm showing you six new other materials. And with these new materials and with all these new different compo compositions come also a lot of different properties. And hopefully with all those properties, they can come new applications. So applications of these materials, we have shown now that they can be used as phosphors or active materials for LEDs. As I mentioned, they have also potential for solar cells. And people in other groups have shown that these materials have, can be used in photo detectors. Uh, further, we think that they can, they can be used for other things, such as spintronics or as photocatalysts. And who knows, with such a chemical diversity, we think that they could even be used for several other things that we're not even thinking right now. Um, so with that, I would like to take chemical and engineering news for this great honor. Uh, it's a real validation of a, a long journey. Uh, but but for, for that, I, I need to also thank my group, which has been amazing and without which I would not be here for sure. And finally, I would like to thank my family here, my parents and my lovely wife and, and daughter, she's here, who have supported me through all this time. And finally, thank you all very much, and I will be happy to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Diego, for that wonderful talk. Um, I wondered, um, you mentioned that when you started your lab, you had a thousand dollars in an empty space, is that, if I heard you correctly. <laughs> um, Maybe for our audience that might not be as familiar, can you talk about what your funding situation is like now um, that you're successful? Is it continue to be challenging? Is it easier for you um, now that you've got a group going? Uh, it's definitely easier for me now. Um, there's still some challenges and limitations. We're definitely not as funded as some of my colleagues in the US, for example. Uh, but we're working towards that and hopefully things will get better in the near future. I have to ask you one other question because I hear that you were a very serious triathlete. <laughs> Maybe you can, are you, are, for, for our audience, I think that you had Olympic aspirations, that level of seriousness. Um, are, do you continue to, um, to participate in sports? Um, and does that have any relationship to kind of your overall perseverance in life? Um, yes, uh, I, I think sport is a great teacher and it definitely gave me a lot of uh, good lessons that I can apply now to my academic and in general my life. Um, for example, the discipline and the perseverance is for sure something that I, that I get from my, from my sporting career. But um, unfortunately, I'm not doing that much at this time, mostly some recreational sports, but, but hopefully I can get back to that very soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Diego. We loved your talk.